exercise 5.9. This is a bigger one. Learning Objective 2, Learning Objective 3, and Learning Objective 5. And let's see what we have here. <clears throat> Applying overhead in a service company. So, so far we've done it in a manufacturing company. <clears throat> We're going to see if we can apply this in a service company. Drew Architectural Design began operations on January 2nd. The following activity was recorded in the company's work in process account for the first month of operations. And we have a T account for work in process with some different labels. Cost of subcontracted work, direct staff cost, studio overhead. We can kind of figure what it means, but the question kind of tells us. So let's see what it says. Drew Architectural Design is a service firm, so the names of the accounts it uses are different from the names used in manufacturing companies. Cost of subcontracted work is comparable to direct materials. Okay. Direct staff cost is the same as direct labor. That's obvious. And studio overhead, I think we can tell, is the same as manufacturing overhead. Completed projects is the same as finished goods. All right. Apart from the difference in terms, the accounting methods used by the company are identical to the methods used by manufacturing companies. That's the important thing. You see, we learn a process and, and that process, if done well, generalizes to other settings. And this is a different setting than manufacturing. So if we have our process down, it should apply to different companies doing different things. Drew Architectural Design uses a job order costing system and applies studio overhead to work in process on the basis of direct staff costs. That's important now. Let's make a note of that because so far we've been using either machine hours or direct labor hours. But what we have here is we're told that our applied <coughs> manufacturing overhead is equal to some predetermined overhead rate, which we'll probably figure out times, our actual direct labor dollars. Not hours now, it's direct labor dollars. So let's pay attention. It's important to read the question carefully because we could mess up and use hours instead of dollars, right? At the end of January, only one job was still in process. This job, the Kareen Corporation Headquarters Project, had been charged with 13500 in direct staff costs. <clears throat> All right, so number one, compute the predetermined overhead rate that was used during January. So we have to compute a predetermined overhead rate. Well, if we look at our work in process T account, we see that studio overhead was 320000 Well, the way that something flows in to the work in process account is it flows out of manufacturing overhead through an applied rate, not the actual amount, an applied. So we know that 320000 if we look at what I've written here, applied manufacturing overhead is our predetermined overhead rate times our actual dollars. We're told that applied manufacturing overhead was $320,000 times our predetermined overhead rate, which we do not know, times our actual direct labor costs. Well, when we look in that T account, we see our direct staff costs are $200,000. So the only thing missing here is our POR. But look what we have here. We have one unknown in one equation. 320000 equals something times 200000 so it doesn't take much to see that we can take our POR and that's equal to 320,000 divided by 200,000. That's just that's just algebra, right? Equals 1.6. So what does this mean now? Because we're using dollars, not labor hours. What does this 1.6 mean? Notice this is not dollars. And I'll tell you why. It's because we're dividing $320,000 by $200,000. The dollar signs cancel out, so there's no dollar sign to this. It is 1.6 times or 160% of direct labor. In other words, what we're saying here when we're using direct labor dollars is we're saying that for every $1 in direct labor that we incur, we will apply $1.60 in overhead. So if we incur $1,000, 
We multiply that by that thousand dollars by 1.6 or 160 percent, same thing. We should get 1600. So when we're using dollars, we get a multiple, 1.6 times whatever this dollar cost is, or 160 percent of the cost. So let's be aware that this is not ours. So for number one, compute the predetermined overhead rate that was in use in January. There it is right there. It's 1.6 times our direct labor cost is our predetermined overhead rate. Let's move on to the second part of this. Uh, compute the following job cost sheet for the partially Kare completed Kareen Corporation headquarters project. So we have number two, we have to complete a job cost sheet. And this is for the Kareen job. And we're given um, cost of subcontracted work. And remember, this was uh, uh, comparable to direct materials. We don't know what it is. We're given a question mark. We have direct staff costs. And we don't know what that amount is either because we're given a question mark. So we have to figure that out. We're given studio overhead. And also, we don't know what that is. We have to figure it out, and that should give us a total. And our total, we don't know either. So how do we begin to solve something in which we have nothing to work with? Well, that's not entirely true. It's not that we don't have anything to work with. We have to look for the clues. The first clue it says in here, if we read the last paragraph, at the end of January, only one job was still in process. Only one job. This job had been charged with 13,500 indirect staff costs. So for direct staff costs, we know that this has been charged with 13,500 because there's only one job left. <clears throat> this is the job, 13,500. But we know our applied manufacturing overhead simply is our POR times our actual direct labor costs. If our direct labor costs were 13,500, we know our multiple is 1.6. So we multiply 13.5 by 1.6, we can figure out this number is 21,600. So there we go, but we're still missing two variables. How would we solve those two variables? Well, we're told that there's only one job left in work in process. It's this job right here, the Kareen job. And of the job left in, it was charged with 13,005. So let's look at work in process and see what the total amount in work in process is left. And that will give us this number down here. So work in process, I'm just going to use shortcuts here. Direct materials were 90,000. Then we had direct staff costs, which is equivalent to direct labor. It was 200,000. And we had studio overhead, which is comparable to manufacturing overhead of $320,000. And if we total this side, we get to 610,000 as our debit side. And 570,000 of this was sent to finish goods inventory. And there's 570. So if we take the difference between the two, we have $40,000 left in work in process. The question says there's only one job left in work in process, and it's the Kareen job. So we know that this job totals $40,000. Now you're wondering, but it said 13.5. No, it didn't. It didn't say 13.5 was left in the Kareen job. It said there was only one job left in work in process, and it was the Kareen job. Of this job, 13.5 of it was direct labor, was direct staff costs. So we know the first line is 13.5. We know our total is 40. We can multiply it by the uh, 1.6 to get our 21.6 for studio overhead. All we need now is to finish off the this total here. And all we're doing is we're just subtracting the differences here. We'll get 4,900. There we go. What looked difficult and intimidating really isn't because there was only one job left in work in process and it totaled 40,000. That is 5.9. Exercise 510 is just a single learning objective, learning objective 6. Let's see what we have. Schedule of cost of goods manufactured and cost of goods sold. Well, we've seen this before. 
So this should be easy. We should fly through this. The following data from the just completed year are taken from the accounting records of Eccles Company. We have sales, direct labor, raw material, etc. And we have three inventory accounts, both beginning and ending balance. So we have a lot of information. Let's just go right, right to what's required here. Number one, prepare a schedule of cost of goods manufactured. Assume all raw materials used in production were direct materials. Well, so we don't have to worry about uh, any raw materials going to manufacturing overhead. So let's begin here. How do we begin these? Remember, raw materials inventory, we'll start with our beginning balance. And we're told that that is $8,000. To that, we will add, remember, how many beer did we start with? How much beer did we buy? We add our purchases. And we have 132. For those who are just joining the videos now wondering, what's this guy talking about beer? You have to go back and, re and, and see what I mean. Raw material available uh, makes $140,000. Less what's left in the fridge on Monday morning, right? Less raw materials inventory. The ending balance. And the ending balance was $10,000. So that means we used $130,000 in raw materials. Raw materials used were $130,000. So now we're ready to do the cost of goods manufactured. We need this number. Remember, that's one of our inputs is raw materials. So work in process beginning balance, we're told, is $5,000. And to that, we will add our manufacturing costs. The first one we add is raw materials used which we've already figured out at $130,000, right? That's that number right there. Then we're going to use direct labor, and direct labor, we're told, is $90,000. That's part of the information given. Now, remember, when we charge manufacturing overhead, it's what we applied. Manufacturing overhead applied. And we know that that is $210,000. We're told that it's two hundred ten. dollars We're just copying numbers here. So that gives us $430,000. And added to the five, we have $435,000 of work in process available. From that, we subtract what we have left in the work in process because that didn't leave. So we subtract our ending balance of $20,000. And this number here, 415000 once we're finished this, this is our cost of goods manufactured. Wasn't that nice and simple? There we go. So all we did was we copied the, uh, the information given to us in the blue boxes on page 187. It says clearly, manufacturing overhead applied to work in process 210. Now, the line below it says actual manufacturing overhead costs. That's in there to confuse you. See, the question wants to know, do you know that in constructing the cost of goods manufactured schedule, you are to use the applied amount for manufacturing overhead and not the actual? Beautiful. Bravo. We did that, right? Number two, prepare a schedule of cost of goods sold. Well, the schedule of cost of goods sold uh, uh, takes over from where we left off. We pretty much just start with finished goods inventory. Let's begin with our beginning balance. And that is 70000 To that, we will add our cost of goods manufactured, which is this number over here is becomes this line. So 415000 That means we have $485,000 of finished goods that we can sell. Finished goods inventory available. From that, let's subtract our finished goods inventory our ending balance, and that is $25,000. What does that leave us? 460. What do we call this number that left finished goods inventory? We call it the cost of goods sold. So there we go, 460,000. We're just breezing through this one, aren't we? Number three, prepare an income statement. Okay, let's do the income statement. So to do the income statement, um, we're going to need to know how to adjust our cost of goods sold. Remember now, we, we use the applied amount in figuring out cost of goods manufactured, but the actual amount was different. The actual amount was $10,000 higher. So if we take our actual manufacturing overhead, now I'm doing it up front. 
as you were doing the income statement, once you got to cost of goods sold, you would have said, whoops, I got to stop and figure this out. So by anticipating that I have to figure this out, I'm doing it now. Actual manufacturing overhead minus the applied manufacturing overhead equals 220 was our actual minus 210 was our applied which leaves a positive balance of 10,000 meaning that we had more actual than we applied that means we under applied when we under apply what's the rule the rule is always we close out to cost of goods sold that's the rule so once now that we know that we're ready to do the income statement right let me show you how we do this on the income statement so we start with sales 643,000 that's just a number that's given to us from that we subtract our cost of goods sold but we subtract what's called an unadjusted cost of goods sold and our unadjusted cost of goods sold is four hundred and sixty thousand dollars now we under applied we under applied so this means that that should be ten thousand dollars higher so for our adjustment we add our adjustment that's a plus sign we add our adjustment to cost of goods sold of ten thousand dollars and that gives us a total cost of goods sold of four hundred and seventy thousand dollars so that our gross margin is one hundred and seventy three thousand dollars now I'm leaving off all the dollar signs on here normally you'd put them in just just for presentation purposes less our two costs we have our, our our selling we have more costs it's just that we group them into what's called SGNA selling general and administrative so here's our selling for one hundred thousand dollars and our general and administrative expense falls into this category and this we're told is forty three thousand dollars that's 143,000 here take that off we have thirty thousand dollars left this is called our operating profit now resist the urge to call this net income this is not net income this is operating profit this is earnings before interest and taxes all your depreciation and everything is off of there so it's not EBIT da the DA once we get to this number here once we get SG&A off, all we have left is interest and taxes. And this is part of what's called a multi-step income statement. You should know this by now. But this is earnings before interest and taxes. Do not call this net income. That is wrong. It is operating profit or operating income, one of the two. Anyways, that is how we deal with underapplied overhead closed out to cost of goods sold is we record what our cost of goods sold is based on our schedule of cost of goods sold then we do an adjustment to adjust for it on the income statement. Ta-da!